there, everybody. Hi. And to all those watching by video all over the world, from North America to Asia to Australia, New Zealand, God bless you. And this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Everybody say, I will receive my miracle. I will receive God's love today. I will receive God's love today. Amen. Amen. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Father in heaven, we ask you to speak to us by the power of your word, change and transform our lives. From 1 Corinthians, let's read together. Do you not know? that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Tell someone beside you, honor God with your body. We think our bodies are our own. We think that we own our bodies. Brothers and sisters, the Word of God says, the Bible says, God says, you are not your own. You've got to honor God with your body. Amen? Amen. And Sirach chapter 30, let's read together. It is better to be poor but strong and healthy than to be rich but poor in health. A sound, healthy body and a cheerful attitude are more valuable than gold and jewels. Everybody say, I want to be healthy. You know, brothers and sisters, can I ask you a question? Ask me what? How much are you willing to pay for your health? How much are you willing to pay for your health? 10,000 pesos? 20,000 pesos? 100,000 pesos? You know what I noticed? I noticed that if you are healthy, you don't want to pay so much. You know, because you're healthy. But the moment you get sick, you are willing to spend a lot. Amen? Not only that, you know, I have a friend of mine, his daughter has cancer. And you know, he intimated to me one time, he said, you know, Brother Bo, when your daughter has cancer, you are willing to spend everything. And I am willing to sell my house, sell my car, spend everything for the health of my daughter. Health is precious. You agree with me? It is so precious. It is so valuable. You know, the Bible is right. We read it a while ago from the book of Sirach. And it says, let's read again. It is better to be poor but strong and healthy than to be rich but poor in health. Do you agree with that? Yes. The Bible says a sound, healthy body and a cheerful attitude are more valuable than gold and jewels. Yes? yes. Everybody say, I want to be healthy. And if you want to be healthy, brothers and sisters, I'm going to reveal to you what the Bible says about health. Twelve very crucial, critical, important steps on how to become healthy. Are you ready? Yes. Everybody say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Because I want to be healthy. <laughs> Here's number one. Number one is you've got to prophesy your good health. Say that with me. Put your hands over your chest. Everybody say, I'm prophetic. We think that there's certain special people who are prophetic. I'm going to tell you now, seriously, every single human being on the planet is prophetic because you're words of power. When God created the sun, the moon, the stars, the valleys, He said, let there be light, let there be the mountains. Let... He just spoke it and things were created. You have that same power, not as much of course, but the same equivalent in terms of human, human terms. You have the power to create. You know, when, when if every day you wake up in the morning and say, life is wonderful, life is beautiful, you know what's going to happen? The whole day you're going to spot beautiful things, wonderful things. Be oh, that's beautiful. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, that's wonderful. At the end of the day you say, ah, I was right. Life is wonderful. But if you wake up in the morning and you say, pangit ng buhay. Ay, nako, life is ugly. And then the whole day, uh, ugly, 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 ugly. And then, you, you know, at the end of the day, you say, I was right, life was ugly. You know, your power, you, the words that you say are prophetic. You know, I was, I was reading about this Indian tribe there in the States. A long time ago, an old person in that tribe will just, will, you know, he knew when he was going to die. In fact, he would call a party. On that day, he'd wake up, he'd, he'd call the whole tribe and he'd say, it's, it's going to be the day I'm going to die. 
And so, and so this, this old man would gather his children, his grandchildren, and he, he, they'd have a party, they'd have a ritual, he'd say farewell, they'd say some prayers, and then at the end of the day, you know, as the sun would set, he would enter his tent, he would lie down, and he would die. You know, we do not know the power we have over our lives. Sigmund Freud would talk about the death wish. There are people who have this death wish. I've met people like that. They talk to me and they say, you know, Bo, I think I'm going to die when I'll be 50. Why? You know, my father died when he was 50. My mother died when she, when she was 50. My grandparents, they died when they were 50. I think I'm going to die when I'm 50. Don't say that. No, really, I think I'm going to die. You know, when at 51, he died. <laughs> there, there is more to it in terms of like our death wish and that our power over our lives, you know, we, we, we're, our words and our thoughts have power. Amen? That's why every morning, I'm going to challenge you every morning, just say to yourself, I'm happy and healthy. You know, I'm happy and healthy. Say that again, I'm happy and healthy. I'm happy and healthy. There are people whose confession is, is terrible. Masakitin ako. I'm sickly. I really am sickly. You know, if you keep on saying that for crying out loud, every cell in your body will say, what did he say? You're sickly. You're sickly. You know, every cell will communicate to one another. The heart cell and the cells of the liver and the cells of your blood, they talk to one another. He, he said, we're sickly. Oh, we're sickly? Okay, yeah, right. We're sickly. And the whole thing breaks down. You know, a, a bacteria here and a back. Oh, there's a bacteria. We're sickly. You know, and we, they, they accept it. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, right now in your body, you've got bacteria, you've got, to, you've, you've got tuberculosis in your lungs, but you don't have TB. But the germs are there. The reason why they don't give in is because of a whole multitude of factors we're going to talk about today. But the important thing is, you've got to say, you know, let's prophesy to one another. Can you say that? Hold the hand of the person beside you and tell that person, you are healthy. And say that and believe in that. You're strong and healthy. Here's something else I want you to say. Put your hands over your chest with me. Say this with me. I'm going to live until 100. Healthy and strong. Amen. Now you say that every single day and believe it with all your heart. Here's number two. Number two is live with a clear conscience. Say that with me. Sirach would say this from chapter 38 together. My son, when you are ill, do not be depressed, but pray to the Lord that he will heal you. Renounce your faults, keep your hands unsoiled, and cleanse your heart from all sin. You know, but before I go to, before I go to live, living with a clear conscience, just, just I forgot to mention this uh, about prophesying your, your, your good health. There is this guy I know. He likes praying over people, you know, and... The problem with that is that they don't get well. He was telling me, you know, Brother Bo, when I pray over someone, they die. <laughs> and I don't know why. And then I, 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 was, I was telling him, I, I think I know why. Because you're Kapampangan. You're from Pampanga. I, my father comes from Pampanga, by the way. Magalang Pampanga. You know, because when you pray over people, I've heard you, I've heard you. You know, you, you, you know Kapampangans, they lack H. You know, be healed. Be healed. <laughs> I was kidding, okay, so. <laughs> Step number two is live with a clear conscience. I'll tell you why. You know, Sirach is so powerful. It says, renounce your faults. Keep your hands and soil and cleanse your heart from sin because there is no division between your soul, your emotions, and your body. So if you've got sin in your heart and, and if, you, if you have guilt and you carry your guilt, your whole body is, is saying, my gosh, there's guilt. You know, and, and whatever you don't confess, Confession is the way by which sin goes out of your, of your body and of your life. When, when you don't confess the sin, what happens is you keep it in your body and it will come out in your body in forms of tumors and sicknesses and ulcers and all sorts of things. And, and just clear, live with a clear conscience if you want to be healthy. Number three, learn to relax. Learn to relax. 1 Peter 5 verse 7 says, Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. And Matthew 14 verse 23 says about Jesus, He went up on the mountain by Himself to pray. When you, when you hear the word, say relax. 
the first thing you hear, you, you think of is somebody watching TV with a nice, you know, glass of orange juice, sipping it, and his feet is up, propped up, propped up. No, that's not what I mean by relaxation. I believe the first definition of relaxation for me, for me, is to release your stress. Stress has caused more diseases than bacteria and virus and, 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 and all sorts of the environment. Stress is a disease, is, is, is what causes disease for many, many people. If you want to be healthy, you've got to release your stress. They made an experiment of two groups of people. The whole, everybody, they, 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 this group of psychologists, they said, write in your diary. But the first group of people, group number one, they said, write about superficial things during the day. I watched a movie today. I'm guapo guapo ni Brad Pitt, you know? Brad Pitt was really handsome. You know, superficial things, just write every day. And the second group of people, they said, write in your diary, but write about the traumatic things that happened in your life and release your stress on paper and talk about your feelings and your pain and so on. So these two groups of people were doing that, all diary writers. And after a few months, they came with doctors, they went through a battery of tests. Guess what? Group number two, the people who wrote about their traumatic stresses in life and released them on paper, their immune system dramatically improved, dramatically improved. Group number one, who wrote about superficial things, nothing happened to their immune system. The, you know, there are three Ps on how to release stress, I think. Number one is paper. Write it down in your journal, you know. Here's number two, person, letter P. Person, being able to go. I, I thank God I've got friends. I thank God I've got a wife. I thank God I've got friends. When I, when I feel heavy, when I feel burdened, I, I pick up the phone, I talk to someone, you know, and I feel lighter. Do you experience the same thing? When there's fears, when there's worries, when there's stress, talk to someone. Ask for prayer, which is number three, prayer. Jesus did that. You know, he'd go to a lonely place and pray and, and release his stress unto the Lord. Number four. It says, choose to be happy. Everybody say that. I want you to read very carefully Proverbs 17. Let's read together. Being cheerful keeps you healthy. It is slow death to be gloomy all the time. I want you to look at the face of the person beside you. Is that person happy or gloomy? If the person's face is gloomy, I want you to tell that person condolence. Nakikirama yako. But you know what? You are condoling the person's early death. Because, because the Bible says that if you are gloomy all the time, you're, you're not going to be strong. You're not going to be healthy. But you have to choose to be happy. Everybody say that. The key word is choose. Choose to be happy. There's this other doctor and he did incredible amounts of studies on cancer patients who die and of heart of people who died of heart disease and he was able to profile four types of personalities. How many? Four. four. And this is what he said. I found it very intriguing. He said this, after all years and years of studying, he said, type one personality are those with a lifelong pattern of hopelessness. They, they, are, they are hopeless. They like being hopeless. You know, every day they wake up and they're, they're hopeless. Guess what? 75%, that's what he found out. 75% of people, adults, who die of cancer are type 1 personality. And then 15% of people, adults, who die of heart disease, 15% are type 1 personality. Type 2 personality are people of severe blame and anger in their life. Angry, they're always angry. And they respond with anger in their life. 75% of people who die of heart disease are type 2 personality. And 15% of people who die of cancer are our type 2 personality. Type 3 personality are people who have mixed hopelessness and anger. They bounce between hopelessness and anger, hopelessness and anger. Guess what? He discovered that 9% of adults who die of cancer and heart disease are type 3 personality. What is the type 4 personality? He says these, these people are people who choose to be happy. They, they, just, they just know that happiness is an inside job. It doesn't depend on the circumstances. They wake up in the morning and they say, I choose to be happy no matter what happens. And they make a decision to be happy. Are you getting what I'm saying? And he discovered that only 1% of people who die of cancer or of heart disease have type 4 personality. And what kind of personality do you have? Type 1? Hopeless? Type 2? Always angry, type three, a mixture of both. 
or top t or, 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 or type four. I hope it's type four. Say, say someone, t tell someone beside you, choose to be happy. Choose to be happy. Amen? Amen. And, and here's step number five. You've got to invest in friendships. Everybody say that. I hope you've got relationships in your life that make you happy. You know, life is about relationships. I, I really want to thank God that I'm, if you're going to look at my life and you're going to see me very busy, but you know what? One of the highlights of my week would be my dates. I've got a date with my wife. I've got a date with my eldest boy. I've got a date with my youngest boy. I, I do that now once a week. Once a week, you know, spend, I have a date with my mother. I have a date with my friends. Sometimes when I eat lunch with friends, it's three hours long. Just being able to pick their brains and being able to ha laugh and share. You've got to have friends. You've got to have relationships. If you are a happy person, I'm sure it's because you've got happy relationships. If you are not happy in your life, it's because you have no relationships or your relationships are unhappy. And brothers and sisters, if you want to be healthy and strong, you've got to invest in relationships. Amen? Here's step number six. Work with purpose and passion. Ecclesiastes 2 verse 24. Let's read. A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. Everybody say satisfaction in his work. This too I see is from the hand of God. Brothers and sisters, discover your passion. And when you discover your passion, give it your all. And you will be healthier than someone who does not know his passion and does not give his life to his passion. Is your job connected to your passion? I hope it is. If it's not, find a way by which you could serve the Lord and, and maybe, maybe have a ministry where you could give your passion. I just came from the States and I, I shared this in the video to you. Last time I, I was not here. I said that, you know, for 10 days, I preached 10 times in 10 cities. And people were telling me that's inhuman. That's right. 10 days preaching in Los Angeles and San Francisco and Virginia and Vancouver and New York and New Jersey, hopping from one place to another. And I'll tell you, it is inhuman, except for someone like me whose passion is preaching. When it's your passion, you do great things and, and wonderful things. And brothers and sisters, was it tiring? Yes, it was. But it was also immense fun because it's my passion. What is your passion? Find it, discover it, and give your life to it, and you will be healthier. Amen? Amen? People die right after retirement if they do not find their passion. Do you know of people like that? At the age of 65, they get away from their job, they retire, they think of playing golf, going on vacations. After three years, they die because of lack of passion. They wake up in the morning, they don't know what to do. You've got to discover your passion. I, I bet you this, you will last until 100, 101 if every morning you have a passion and you do it for the Lord. Here's number seven. Take deep breath. Say that with me. You know how important breathing is? I met a man. Uh, I, I met a man. He, this is funny because the, he had emphysema. It's a disease of the lungs. And so I asked him, bro, did you smoke before? And he said, no. I said, my gosh, where did your emphysema come from? And... He told me, my doctor said, it's because of lazy breathing. And I said, what's that? I haven't, first time I heard it. And he said, oh, my doctor is a really specialist guy and he knows about these things. Lazy breathing. My gosh, is there such a thing? He said, you know, for my whole life, I never exercised. And my breathing has always been shallow, you know. And so, and he was talking to me and I started researching. And I said, yeah, there should be times during your day where you take deep breaths. In the morning when you wake up, maybe one, two minutes, just deliberately breathing and breathing deeply. It's the best way of removing toxins from your body. And uh, do it, you know, when you're stressed out, when you feel heavy, when you feel so busy, and, and, it's, and you just stop, sit down, and then take deep breaths. And it, it will just bless you. It will just bless you. Here's number seven. Number eight, get enough sleep. Say that with me. In Psalms 127, I love this verse. Let's read together. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor in, in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Has your God given you sleep? How many hours do you sleep? I hope it's enough. Brothers and sisters, when I preach, sometimes I see some people sleeping. And, and don't, I, I don't take that personally, really. When, when I see some, sometimes it's the same person every Sunday. 
you know? I, I scan the crowd and this guy just, I don't care how many jokes I say, how, how, how funny I get on stage, the guy just is sleeping. I, I don't take it personally, I'll tell you why. I pity that person because he's not getting enough sleep. And, and what happens is his body's compensating. The problem is, you know, if, if you do that, it's just listen to your body and say, wait a minute, why am I sleeping during a talk? Or why am I sleeping during work? That simply means you need to stop watching TV at night and start sleeping more. Amen? I mean, you, you just have to listen to your body. You need, maybe, we, we have different sleep needs, right? Some need seven, eight, nine, ten hours. But you just have to get what your body needs. There is what you call deep sleep. And some of us, we don't get the deep sleep that we need. Get it. There's what you call REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. That's when you dream. You're supposed to dream five to six times a day. And when you get this deep sleep, you know what? Your body is healing itself. Some of us, we don't arrive at that point anymore because our bodies you know, are tired and our sleep is shallow and it is short. Tell someone beside you, matulog ka pa. <laughs> get some sleep. You know what? It's very, very important. And number nine, move it or lose it. Everybody say that. Here's, here's the minimum that studies have shown. You need at least one hour a day of physical exercise, of movement. One hour every day. Are you getting that? Are you getting, I hope you're getting that. I've made a decision a long time ago. I want to do that. It took, it took a while, but finally, one day I said, it's now or never. And so now I'm giving myself one hour a day for physical exercise. And uh, I either go to a stationary bike or, or, or go to the gym or, or walk around or do something to be able to be physically active. You know, there was a time we didn't have to do that. It was built into our day. Because a, a long time ago, you know, you had to take long walks. Now, mass transportation, jeepney, bus, train, tricycles. I mean, for crying out loud, Filipinos, there's a small, you're going to go to a sari-sari store, a little store in the corner, ride the tricycle. You know, instead of walking, that's what we do. There was a time when our grandparents, when they would wash their laundry, it was very physical. Now, washing machine. You got what I'm saying? There was a time when people would go out and walk and, and run, you know, and, and do a lot of activities for their recreation. Now, watch TV. TV has done more harm to our physical bodies than we think because TV is there. Kids no longer play outside. What they do is they watch TV or play video games or surf the internet. That's what they do. But what we need to do is encourage our kids to do that, but you need to do that to, to give them an example of somebody who goes out. Tell someone beside you, move. move. Exercise. Do something. It's very, very important. You want to honor the Lord with your body. Amen? Amen. You know what? The mo How many of you here are 50 and above? Raise your hand. Can I talk to you for a while? I'm going to challenge you to take those walks. I'm going to challenge you to do something. You know why? Because the moment you hit 50, listen carefully, you lose 1.5% of your, of your muscle mass. 1.5% of your muscle strength if you don't move, if you don't, pr if you don't do something. Now, that's just once a year. Now imagine by the age of 60, you would have lost probably 20% of your muscle strength. By age 70, you would have lost already about 50%. Have you met 70-year-old people who cannot even lift a glass? You know, and, and their bone structure gets affected because they're not moving. They're not exerting their muscles. I've met people who in their 80s, are, are able to do so much, walk, travel, because they keep on moving and they've, they've not lost it. Let me go on to number 10. I love this. Everybody say that. Drink water and eat water-rich food. Amen? I've, 14 years ago, I made a decision that I'll be semi-vegetarian. I, I, I have, for the past 14 years, I've not eaten... Uh, beef, chicken, pork, uh, you know, crabs, shrimps. I've just made that decision. I eat fish and, and uh, vegetables. And I'm still alive. I'm still alive. I'm still normal. And, and the reason why I've done it was just made the decision to, to become healthier. Here's the funny thing. 
in the Bible in the Old Testament, there were a lot of animals that were prohibited from being eaten. D Daniel chapter 1, let's read. Please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food. So royal food would be meat. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. It's in the Bible. And here's step number 11, reduce emotional and physical toxins. Leviticus 11 verse 2 says, these are the animals which you may eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. You know what? Why were there in the Old Testament some animals that you were not supposed to eat? Oink, oink. And uh, crustaceans, crabs, shrimps, fish without scales, you're not supposed to eat. According to the Old Testament, in the New Testament, all, all, all bans have been lifted and we can eat anything. But you would wonder why. There's a group of, of doctors who have studied all these animals that were prohibited and they found out that they, all these animals, have more toxins than the others. For example, crustaceans, shrimp and crabs are the scavengers of the sea and so they have more toxins. Fish without scales have more toxins because it is through the scales where the toxins go out of the fish. So if you don't have scales, you have more toxins. So this group of doctors, they were saying, maybe one of the reasons why God, uh, why, why it's in the Bible. You know what? I'm not saying stop eating pork. I'm not saying that. But maybe you can minimize. And step number 12. Step number 12 is keep medical invasiveness to a minimum. Say that with me. Sirach 38 talks about how a doctor and medicine are blessings from God. Do you agree with the Bible? Yes. I believe that. I believe doctors and medicines are a gift from God. And we need to listen to them. We need to allow them to bless us. But at the same time, I want you to make that choice that if there is, you know, between invasive and non-invasive, then try, try, if possible. I mean, there are times when you can't. You've got to get the invasive thing. But if the non-invasive is available and it can be done, then do it. You've got a headache. I mean, instead of popping a pill, you've got a headache, you know, pop a pill. But how about the other option? Removing stress from your life, exercising more, changing your diet, and then maybe it will solve your headache permanently instead of keep up popping pills. You got what I'm saying? No, you didn't. Are you getting what I'm saying? There, you know, you've got, you've got, you've got ulcers. Now, there are times, I, I remember I had an ulcer. I had an ulcer some years ago. And I, the doctor told me to drink this thing that would, that would uh, decrease the, the acid in my, in my, in my intestines. And, and that really helped a lot. But then, as I was taking that medicine, I, ha I had to ask myself the question, why do I have ulcers? You know? And I found out why. It's the stress. I was allowing it to creep into my life. Now I'm able to manage my stress so much more. And I had to learn the hard way. You know, when pain is, is in your body, it is a messenger. Pain is a messenger telling you, do something. There's something wrong. You've got to act. And sometimes what we do is we remove the pain. We shoot the messenger. We kill the messenger and say, no, no pain. You know, we, we drink a pain. You got what I'm saying? What you do is you listen to the pain and you say, okay, I've got to do something. Amen? I'd like to end this talk with a story of a friend of mine. His name is Willie Enriquez. And Willie Enriquez is someone who had a rare kidney disease. And I cannot even mention the name. It's, it's, such, a, it's such a difficult thing to pronounce. But I searched it in the internet and true enough, I saw permanent kidney failure. In fact, it was so bad. It was so bad. Willie talked to his doctor and said, Doc, what's, what's my, you know, like, I mean, do I have a time frame here? Will I die when? And the doctor shook his head and said, You know, Willie, maswerte ka na kung buhay ka pa after six months. Th those were the exact words. You will be lucky if you're still alive, if you're still around after six months. And, and that shook Willie so much. He said, my gosh, I've got six months to live or five months to live or four months to live or three months to live. He, he prayed. He was, he was a man who serves the Lord and, and attends prayer meetings. You know, he prayed and prayed. He asked me for prayer. He asked prayer from so many people. And then he changed his lifestyle. From someone who did not move, he started exercising every single day. 
you won't believe this, but he was telling me, you know what? After office, I go to the gym, play badminton for three hours, sometimes four hours, every single day. I sweated out my toxins. I just said, I'm going to move. And you know what? One of the great things he did was he played with his wife every day. You know, there was, you know, from, 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 from not being with his wife, now he was with his wife every day. And then he brought his kids along, three children. They played every day. The doctor told him he had six months to live two years ago. He's, he's now a walking miracle. And the doctors cannot explain it. The doctors cannot explain it. They said, there is no known cure for your disease. And when we give you medicines, it's just to slow down, slow down the rise of creatinine, you know, slow down the progress of your disease. But his disease is actually reversing. His disease is actually going back. And they don't know why. I know why. You know why. We have more power than we think we have over our bodies. Amen? Amen? And, and you know, I, I really believe that. I remember I, I shared you this story a long time ago. Uh, I'll share it to you again. There was this guy, he had palpitations. He goes to the doctor, and this is a true story. You know, he says, Doc, you know, you know can you examine? Went through some exam battery of tests, and then the doctor told, tells him, you've got a galloping rhythm in your heart. Okay? And so this guy says, wow, thanks, Doc. And so the, the, the doctor says, come back to me after, after, you know, I don't know what, two weeks or one month. I don't know what the doctor said. So he, he left. After, after two weeks or one month, he came back to the doctor, went through the tests again. And the doctor said, are, are you the same guy who came here two weeks ago? And, and, and he said, why, doc? Your heart is perfect. And, and the guy said, yeah, that's what you told me two weeks ago, that my heart was perfect. I said, no. I said, you had a galloping rhythm. And the man said, yeah, galloping rhythm. My heart is as strong as a horse. <laughs> and the doctor said, no, galloping rhythm means your, your heart was sick. He did not understand. He thought the doctor was telling him his heart was perfect. And you know what? Words are so powerful. He believed in it. My, oh. And his heart responded. You got what I'm saying? I have a friend who went to a healing mass, even if he was a skeptic. He went, he went to mass, healing mass, because his wife pulled him there, but, but he did not like, really believe that anything will happen in a healing mass. He had a tumor. He had a tumor in his kidney. But you know what? Two days after, he goes to the doctor, the tumors vanished completely. No tumors whatsoever were found after the healing mass. Now, here's, here's something that came to my mind. That guy, he was a skeptic. He's not even attending prayer meetings. But you know, that's the power of God. The power of God is available to you. And I want you to believe that you've got more power than you think you have over your body. And let's pray for healing today. The same power that healed Willie Enriquez, the same power that healed my friend who had a tumor, the same power that healed this woman I prayed for years ago. She had cancer of the, of the, in the reproductive system. And, and the doctors told her she had six months to live. I saw her five years later and she was alive. You know, the same power that healed her, the same power that healed uh, the blind men and the lame men during the time of Jesus is here in our midst. And God can heal you. Amen.